Yeah, so it's almost like all of this preparation and training crystallizes when you're doing, I, I don't know if this is the right term, but virgin voyage, like what you're saying, there's no line and you're exploring how you're exploring with your diving partner. Like once you have all the training down, the only thing left to chance is chance itself. Like mm -hmm. there's no er human error there because you've, you've perfected as much as you possibly can in the training front. Um, like what, what is a typical week for you? There's no such thing. Um, they're all different. So, um, I teach quite a bit, but I try and get, um, my fun diving in. And lately <clears throat> we haven't been doing, um, very much exploration. So I've got exploration going in, in several different spots. We just haven't got back to it. Um, the hurricane really messed up the town. Um, my main dive partner, his house was literally destroyed. Yeah. Um, took him two and a half years to rebuild it. So I was waiting for him. And then by the time we got that done and got, you know, him back diving a lot and frequently, um, then of course I got diagnosed with cancer and it didn't look like I was going to make it to the end of the year. And then we beat that. So, um, now it's been getting back to, cause you don't want to just jump into going back 16,000 feet. Um, so a lot of the exploration has kind of been on hold. Um, but I still do a lot of fun diving. Um, I get people come in from other countries and, uh, that I've known for a long time. We'll, we'll go diving or, um, the guys I work with or friends. So to me, every dive, every cave dive is a, is a good cave dive. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, um, so over the years, I've probably laid 150, 200,000 feet of line oh, out. Oh, man, that's... And cave exploration is different than it was 30 years ago. Sure. Um, when they'd come across the cave that had never been in before, and you're just dumping line everywhere. But now there's been so many explorers beat up the caves, you know, for line so much that you're, you're doing harder and harder stuff. There's a group called the KUR, Great Divers, um, they're working, uh, exploring Wiki Wachi. Now that's just 400 feet deep. So they're, they'll do a two, three, four hour dive, and then they'll have 12 to 15 hours of decompression to do. <laughs> so it takes a lot of dedication to do, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to br just breathe for 15 hours. Right, right, right. Um, so, um, that is so extreme that it had never been done before. The stuff that I'm doing here, you're going through stuff that is so small that most people would never do it. So right now, the end of the line where we're still working, uh, there's only two of us that have ever been there. And there may never be anybody there. <laughs> um, so it's not like we're doing this as a great service to the community. Yeah, right, right, right. right <laughs> yes, yeah. The chances of anybody getting back there yeah. are slim. Um, there's a lot of people now enjoying the stuff that's within range of yeah yeah, yeah. You know, sure not too many death defying restrictions <laughs> along the way uh my shop manager he's getting some of the stuff that's you know it used to be when i moved here the cave ended at four thousand five hundred feet and he's doing some of the stuff at seven eight thousand feet that's just gigantic and just unbelievably beautiful <laughs> so he's like wow this is amazing yeah, 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 yeah. um but he even he said uh, he'll probably never get to the end of the line i mean that's it's pretty extreme. So, um, but there is no normal day. It's just, um, yeah. you know, as long as I wake up and the sun's shining and then I can go dive in, it's a good day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now the, the, the pararescue jumpers have a saying, you know, that others may live. And obviously that's a little different when it's, we're talking about body recovery, but I think there's also th that motto really encapsulates the fact that like they're willing to put themselves into danger to save other people. And for you, what you do that I feel like a lot of the, the closure or, or rather a lot of the, the, the feeling you get from it has to do with like the closure from the families and everything. Um, so I guess in this, in a way you kind of have that same mentality where you're, you're just kind of going selflessly in pursuit of others. Um, now what was the, <clears throat> I say that because you, you did a rescue in the Dominican Republic. So 
uh, maybe explain that. Like, what was the background of it? How did you get called down there? And what was the outcome of it? So when the two divers first came up missing, um, the Dominican Republic has their own, it's called the DRSS, the Dominican Republic's Biological Society, um, kind of similar to our NSSCS. So they had their own, and they have their own uh, recovery divers. So um, the guy that heads it, uh, Philip Lehman, super nice guy, good friend of mine, um, he was the first one to go out. Um, I think him and Denny, and I don't remember who all was involved, uh, there was there was quite a few of them. So they went in, <clears throat> but it went out to the IUCRR somehow as well um, that there's this, and it might have been the day after, because when they found the first victim, it was so small and tight. A lot of them were in back mount or back mount rebreathers, and they and they couldn't get him out. <clears throat> so it went out if they need help who would be willing to go? And I was one of the ones that said, you know, absolutely, just give me a call, I'll be on a plane. Sure. And they decided that they could do it on their own. So they just kept going back in day after day and they'd bring in more and more and more people and um, more and more experts. And then pretty soon they, by the time they called in Patrick Widman from Mexico, um, it was another super, super guy, um, great diver. Um, him and Philip were good friends, and he thought Patrick was the best diver in the world. So let's bring him in. He can get this done. By that time, I think they were on like 17, 16, 17, 18 experts. <laughs> um, and they just couldn't get him out. And Patrick went over, and then from what I understand, he was calling... Uh, Lamar Hires from Dive Ride, who teaches, who had taught him his IUCR class maybe four or five years before. And he's like, I couldn't get him out. He was stuck. It's really small. It's blah, blah, blah. What can I do? So basically, give me, give me, <laughs> give me something here. Right. Yeah. And Lamar's like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, we, we go in, we look at, you know, kind of like what I said earlier. You could try this, you could try this, you could try this. So he did it. And then he called him the next night. No, that didn't work. What else you got? Well, I don't know. You could try this. You could try this. And from what I understood, uh, on day four, uh, after day four of diving, he went back and called Lamar. And Lamar said, well, when it's impossible, we call Ed. So uh, Patrick called me. Um, and I said, I'll, I'll say he's booking flights right now. So I started getting my gear together. <clears throat> and before I get off the phone with him, he said, I know you have a reputation for doing this by yourself. He said, this is really bad. It's twisty, windy, it's small, it's tight. You need somebody with you. I said, all right. I hung up. And then I went, wait, who am I going to take? <laughs> <laughs> the only other time that I actually let two people go, we, we already talked about right, how that right, turned right. out. <laughs> they left me in there. <laughs> and then they were screwed up in the head for years. <laughs> so I'm like, Sh who do I even call? So... I called my friend Mike Young that owns Kiss Rebreathers. And I said, hey, dude, I know you're busy, bud. And somehow he already knew. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. Whatever you need. So we pack up all our gear. Stacy's booking the flights. And all of a sudden, Philip calls me back and says, you can't come. I'm like, all right, well, they're not going to let you in the country. I'm like, what did I do? Or what do they know I did? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> And he said, the mayor was just here and said, nobody else comes. That we've had the best divers in the world here, and it's too dangerous, and he doesn't want to risk anybody else's life. And I said, well, I'm not going to ever tell the mayor what to do, um, but, you know, these families need closure. And I said, just tell him to Google my name. He'll actually see that I'm pretty good at what I do. <laughs> And he said, I'll talk to him. I'll call you back. And so an hour later, he called back and he said, all right. He said, you could come. You have eight <laughs> days. If you can't do it in eight days, you got to leave. And they're just going to leave the bodies in there. I said, OK. So we, you know, Stacy's in the meantime going, oh, how many days do I book this? I go, apparently eight. <laughs> <laughs> so we fly over and um, 
it's a nice, big, beautiful, well, it's a huge cavern. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it is massive. You could put uh, a 747 in there and then fly a small plane around it. <laughs> um, and then once you get to the end of the cavern, and the opening's so big, like 500 feet back or whatever the end of the cavern is, you can still see the daylight. I mean, oh, it's, yeah, it's just crazy. massive. Yeah. Then you drop through a little hole, and now you're in the cave. And this cave was kind of this big oval. Beautiful cave. And I think we went back around 700 feet or so, wasn't, wasn't the whole long ways. And then there's a tunnel that drops down and it's not even marked. A lot of times they will, we have what's called a line arrow. It's a little piece of plastic that's cut in the, oh, in yeah, the yeah, triangle. Sure. And that points which ways towards the nearest e e opening, exit. Right. Usually when there's a, what's called a jump, like we talked about earlier, there'll be two of those line arrows together. And that signifies there's a jump close I by. See, I see. That's the way out or the way to the nearest exit. And there's a jump close by. Right. This was so small and nasty, they didn't even have it marked. <laughs> and apparently there was another part of it way back here, like 100 feet that way, that you could go in and then it paralleled. And it was through this little mud tunnel <laughs> that was just nasty, muddy. And then the lines came together and went further up and in. And so the one guy's telling us, you know, I said, just tell me where to go. Um, so, so we don't have to search too. Right, right, we right, just yeah. get right to work. Yeah. And he goes, well, I'll take you there. I said, well, you don't have to do that. Just tell me where it is. <laughs> he goes, well, we already have a line in and I'm going to go back with you. And then I'm going to wait on the main, cause he's in the back of my rebreather. I'm going to wait on the main line for you. I'm like, I could be in there all day. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, then I'll be in there all day. So I had briefed Mike ahead of time. I don't know what I'm getting myself into, like I never do. Um, but I, I showed him the, the different harnesses that I had made over the years. And Mike and I have been friends for a really long time, but we had never actually even dove together before. <laughs> um, and so I showed him the harnesses and how they work. And we're in the hotel room, and I put the harness on me and laid on the floor, and then he dragged me around the room <laughs> by the one from the shoulders, and then I put the feet one on. And I said, the shoulder one's going to be in my right pocket. The other one's going to be in my left pocket in case I need you to get them. Right. And he's like, all right. And I said, but really, your only job, I said, I'm going to have to come out backwards. And it'll be zero visibility. And a lot of times when I do that, like one of the recoveries at Vortex, I'm having to drag him out backwards. And I need both hands because the, they're floaty. I have to pull them down, pull them ahead. So I have to let go of the line. That's my only way home. You lose that line, right, right, you're right. dead. Yeah. So I have to let go of that line and then do what I have to do and then I have to reacquire the line. <laughs> and there was times on that one in Vortex where I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just here a minute ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it kind of gives you a pause of, uh, <laughs> was this a good idea? Yeah. So I said, your only job is to have one hand on my leg and one hand on the line and you don't let go of that line. <laughs> And I said, if it turns and I need to go this way and my legs are pointed that way, you just squeeze twice and that means oh, stop. Yeah. And then you move my legs yeah, 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 and yeah. then we go, <laughs> which is what we did. And it worked out flawlessly. But um, <clears throat> so we find him and now there's two of them. And even though there's been 18, 19 days passed, they still had only found the one guy. They assume the other guy's further in, but it's so small they can't get around the body right, right. to search for the other victim. So it took me about four and a half, five hours to get him out. And at first, when we're going along, they had, the, the previous teams had gotten his gear off of him. Uh, taking his BC and stuff off. And I think his fins were off. It was just him in a wetsuit, I think. Um, I can't see anything. Um, the only time I saw him was when he hit my head and part of his <laughs> skull stuck to my mask. And it was kind of <laughs> flopping. Because I, I wear a mask light right here. And all it did was light up white, brown, or red, depending on <laughs> where I was at. Um, until I, until he hit me and then I could yeah, yeah, yeah. get a glimpse of, it looked like a horror movie. <laughs> so when I got him, it kind of went like this 
And so I'm getting him along here, and now I got to make that turn. Well, he's really floaty. He's been in there so long, he's floating. Normally, like if we put you, if you were in a wetsuit, um, you would float. And we would probably have to put five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 pounds of weight on you, and you would be negative. Mm -hmm. They had already put eight or 10 pounds in his wetsuit to weight him down, and he was still stuck to the ceiling. <laughs> so when we got to that turn down, the ceiling went like this, and there was a little ledge there that stuck down about four or five inches. And his head was hitting that ledge, and I couldn't get him. Oh, yeah, yeah. I That's couldn't nice. get him to, to, to bend over the edge. Right. And so I just tell Mike, we need weight. And I had had uh, Philip and a couple of the recovery divers, they, they'd asked, what can we do to help? And they had this little milk crate. And I said, if you could make up weight belts in 12 pound increments. And he's like, why, why 12? I said, because that's all I can carry and still maintain buoyancy. <laughs> that's all the extra lift I have. So he made a bunch of 12 pound increments and they got this somehow back there. So by the time we got back to the main line, that guy's still waiting. <laughs> He's like, hey, you good? And I grabbed a weight belt and handed it to Mike, and I grabbed one, and we headed back in. Now I got to get it on him. Well, he's stuck to the ceiling. <laughs> And I mean, he's really stuck to the ceiling because he's so buoyant. So I have to get this thing fed around him between the cave and him in zero visibility. And the cave's sharp and it's tearing up my suit. Anyway, I get these two. So now I've put 24 pounds on him. He's already got eight or 10 on. <laughs> so he's got 34 pounds of weight on him. That would be enough to sink you to the bottom and I wouldn't be able to move you. <laughs> and he's still stuck to the ceiling. So. Anyway, we're going and going and going. And it's, um, we finally, no, it wasn't enough. We're part way down and I had to, we had to go get more weight. And I couldn't get any more weight belts on him. So I ended up having to take the weights off and stick them in his pockets. <laughs> and that was another task. So anyway, we get him out. And it's, we're four plus hours into this. And I'm yeah. like, yeah, Denny's not going to be here. <laughs> and I pop my head up and he's like, you good? I'm like, shit, he's still here. <laughs> and so I parked him down here and we got the bag ready. And Mike was doing something with the bucket of, there was another bucket of weights there. And, or no, that was where the bucket of weights was that we'd come out to get. And I'm getting the bag ready. I'm getting it unzipped and out. Well, it's floating to the ceiling. And the ceiling's like 25 feet above where the guy is tucked in this ledge. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he came out of that ledge. Now, he's headed for the <laughs> ceiling like a missile. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit, because if he hits that, he's going to, he'll just Discombobulate. explode. Yeah, yeah. And so I zoom up ahead of him, and I grabbed him, and I put my body around his head. And, and then I just hit the ceiling and he hit into me. Right. And now I'm pinned to the ceiling <laughs> by this guy. I'm yeah. like, oh shit, I can't get out of here. And then I'm looking down at Mike. I'm like, hey, dude, I need some help. <laughs> and then he's just looking like deer in the headlights. So finally I get out from underneath him and then I get the bag there. And now I got to try and get the bag between him. And neither one of them are helping me. <laughs> and they're both just, mesmerized by whatever they were doing. So I finally get him tucked in the bag and now I can't get him out. So I go down and I'm like, Mike, come on, I need your help. And so Mike and I are both yanking this because there's three handles on each side of this body bag. We would yank down as hard as we could and then swim and I'm upside down <laughs> and I'd swim and we could get him about that far. And I'm thinking, shit, this is going to take another 10 hours. So, <laughs> I swam down and we grabbed the extra weight belts and we put a 12 pound weight belt on all six of those handles. <laughs> that should have been enough to sink a balloon, a, 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 a dirigible, yeah. but it still wasn't getting him down. And we still had to yank and pull, but we could get a little bit further. So we got, anyway, we finally got him out. And um, when we popped up with this bag, the Dominican Navy military guys were there 
and you could hear him shout, I think they got one. So the Navy divers came over, helped, him get, helped us get him out, got him over, and the general apparently called the mayor. You know, he did it, he did it, he got one out. So the mayor came down, and I think there was just a thing on Facebook the other day. It was a memory from that yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. It was like a couple of days ago. Yeah. And it was pictures of Mike and I with the mayor. <laughs> um, and he's sitting there congratulating me and how all these great divers couldn't do it, and you, and, and you did. How, what did you do different? I said, I don't know. I, <laughs> I wasn't there when they did theirs. Right. I said, I don't know what they did or what they didn't do. I said, all I know is what I do. And I said, I'm pretty good at it. And he's like, okay, tomorrow when you get the other one out, we're going to have a party. We're going to have heroes plaques. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, <laughs> first of all, the last part. Yeah. <laughs> I said, yeah. first of all, this is a job. I said, I've gotten, I have several heroes plaques and awards for bringing people out alive. And I said, you know, I, it's just doing a job. I said, this is just doing a body recovery. This is just to get closure. I said, there's nothing heroic about this. And I said, so let's not plan be planning any parties. Plus, I haven't got him. I said, let's not count any. I said, we don't even know <laughs> yeah, where he's yeah. at. I yeah. said, he might not even be in there. <laughs> and I said, they think he's passed further back. I said, I still got to find him. So anyway, we went in the next day. And uh, Phillip's giving me a rundown of, did you see my reel? Because had, they had torn out all the line in oh, a panic. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. So he had to run new line. Till he found the guy and i said i didn't see anything he said well just past where his feet were would be my reel so i got back to the reel unlocked it and now i have to continue on and it only went maybe 50 or 60 feet and then i just ran into a wall i'm like <laughs> and i had the reel running along this wall and now i have a wall in front of me i'm like oh shit and i've been feeling off to the side over here yeah and i'm like shit he's not in here <laughs> and then i realized oh, there's no wall over here. So I had to find something to tie off to and then turn. And then I'm going in this new direction now because I can't see. If I could have seen, I would have gone, oh, yeah, th that way. And I don't know how far I went that way. Maybe I'm guessing 20 feet. And then I ran into another wall. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> now what? But then I remember... I'd feel up and down and it was only about this tall and I felt, Oh, there's a ledge here. So I go, well, I guess we're going down. So I started going down. Now I'm inverted. Now I'm upside down and I'm going along and I'm just feeling the wall and I'm feeling everywhere. And it was, I remember the walls kind of were wavy and it was just this brownish black i'm guessing slime because the the, the haze in front yeah, of my yeah, light yeah, yeah. was always brown <laughs> and all of a sudden it changed from brown to red and i was like i think i'm in a blood layer <laughs> so we're probably getting close and i went oh there's a really slimy rock there <laughs> and then i thought oh shit that rock has hair <laughs> and, I, and i yelled to mike i go i got him <laughs> so now i gotta tie this reel off Somewhere. Right. Because right. that's our only way home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's nothing to tie off to. I don't really want to tie it to this body. Um, so I told Mike, I need to back up so I can find something. Well, by the time I backed up and found something to tie off to, now i got to find him again. I'm like, <laughs> okay, that wasn't a good idea either. And so I start going again, but now I don't have a line. <laughs> and... <laughs> I finally find him, and I'm like, I have no idea where the fuck I'm at. <laughs> so I yelled to Mike. I said, have you got the line? He goes, I have the line. I'm like, okay. Because he's still got a hold of me. Right, right. So now I go to work on him, and I'm trying to get his gear off of him. And they had cut his BC off of him. And I thought, and I had such a hard time getting weight on him. So I thought, well, I'm going to try and get the tank and regulators and stuff off of him but leave the, the BC on it. Sure, yeah. Because it's got pockets, I'll bet. They all almost all do. So that way I can get the weights in there. <coughs> so I get everything cut off of him, and, and I still can't get him up. And he's buoyant, so he should be coming up easily. And he's not. So I'm feeling all around him, 
you know, trying to figure out where he's hung up. Yeah. And he had another bottle in front of him. And this cave kind of went like that. And he was stuck in that bottle. Oh, uh, like, like an hourglass kind of? Yeah so, yeah, yeah, so he's stuck there with, there's <laughs> enough room for him to get out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's bottles right in front of him. And it's wedged. Oh, I see, I see. Up against that where it, where it kind of comes in. He's here and that bottle's, that bottle's stuck right there. Right, right, right. So I'm reaching down there and I have to do everything by feel because I can't see anything. And on my computer, I have a Z knife for cutting line. So I find the, the clips for his, we call them stage bottles. So I went to unclip it, but he's stuck here and there's so much force down on this clip, I can't get it off. Well, it's on uh, the stage rigging is, is, is like quarter inch rope. Okay. So I get my Z knife out and I cut it and the bottle flips down. So I should have been able to get him up. And I, I can only move him a couple inches. So something's still stuck. So I'm feeling down and now I can find the bottom clip and I can't undo it, so I gotta cut that. But as I'm feeling down, I come to this whole wad of line. All the line they tore out in a panic was all stuck between him and that tank. Oh shit, yeah, yeah. So he had hundreds of feet of line <laughs> wadded up yeah. in here. So I'm trying to get that all out of there. And there again, you know, I can't see anything. <laughs> and all of a sudden I can feel tension and I gotta cut it. And I get the knife out and then all of a sudden I think, is that their line or is that my <laughs> yeah, line? Yeah, I cut yeah, my yeah, line. Yeah. We're screwed. Yeah, yeah. And so I yelled to Mike, <laughs> have you got the line? Because I have the line and I cut it and it broke <laughs> loose. And I was just waiting to hear, what did you do? <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> so I went, Mike, have you got the line? And he's just like, I've already told you I have the yeah. line. But he just <laughs> calmly went, yeah, I, I have the line. I said, okay, so we're good. <laughs> so then we get him started coming out. Back up to the day before when I got the first victim out. Right. You know, I, the, the son of the victim was there before I got there. And he wanted to pick me up from the airport. He paid for a hotel for me and wanted to talk to me. And I'm talking to the guy that the, we're going to be diving out of his dive shop. And he's the guy that was waiting for me the whole time. Sure. And he said, he wants to meet you. He's going to do this. And he's going to bought this. And I said, no. He goes, what do you mean, no? I go, no. I said, I have a rule. I don't, I don't talk to anybody till I'm done. I said, so I will not stay in that hotel. It's got to be somewhere else that he doesn't know where it is. And I said, he has to be told it's nothing personal. I will be more than happy to talk to him as long as he wants when we're done, but not before. He goes, I got it. Well, when we got the father's body out. Apparently his wedding ring had fallen off. And we don't know this. Nobody knows this because they've just inventoried the body. He hasn't even seen the body. Right, right, right. And the next day we're coming out and I was working so hard and I got him to this downhill spot and we had to put more weights on him. And we had to go get weight belts and bring them up and we're at an angle and I've got to take the weights off the weight belt now and put them in his pockets. So I have to, and I'm on this angle. So I have to take the weights off the weight belt and I have to set them down. But I'm on an angle. If I set them down, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. all slimy. They'll slide away. Right. So I find this one little rock about the size of a bowling ball that's flat. And I set it on there. Then I take another one off. Now I have to put this one on top of that one. <laughs> without knocking that one off right. and then the next one and the next one it's like playing jenga yeah, yeah, in the yeah, dark yeah. in the water <laughs> with uh weights <laughs> then i threw the weight belt away now i gotta pick them back up without knocking the rest <laughs> of them off put them in a pocket come back find it which seems very easy but it's not right. so i get you know these two weight belts worth of weights in him and we're back to going and at one point i remember I started to overbreathe my rebreather. I was so exhausted. What, what, is, what does that mean? So we talked about when I breathe out, I yeah. breathe out that metabolized yeah. oxygen into car the form of carbon dioxide. Yeah. The rebreather scrubs that carbon dioxide out. Okay, got it. If you overbreathe a regulator or you overbreathe a rebreather, 
you're breathing so hard that 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 gas is not going all the way through oh, see, and getting scrubbed and you can now your carbon dioxide levels growing right, right and now i am in at risk of passing out I see, from I see. hypoxia okay or uh hypercapnia so at one point i just stop and i gotta breathe and get get my shit together and mike just knows that i've stopped and so he's shaking my leg <laughs> are you okay <laughs> <laughs> i don't want to talk so i just said i'll stop he's like i'll stop so I've just stopped. I'm like, I'm trying to get things all sorted out. And then pretty soon he's like shaking my leg. Are you okay? <laughs> I said, I'll stop. And he's like, okay, got it. I'll stop. And he said, now we're in zero visibility. <laughs> and he's telling me later, it was the weirdest thing. He said, zero visibility. But if I'd put my head up against the ceiling, he said, I could see a little bit of you know, haziness, huh. but I could yeah. see the rocks, you know, for a couple inches, sure. maybe a foot. He said, but I remember just waiting for you to go again. I wasn't going to ask you a third time. <laughs> and he said, all of a sudden there was a hole in the water of zero visibility where I could see crystal clear. And there was a wedding ring on the floor and I picked it up and I blinked and the, that hole was gone. It was back to zero visibility. And he said, I'm feeling it. Did that just happen? <laughs> and he was like, I got something. And he put it in his pocket. That's crazy. And it was the first victim's wedding ring. Out of an entire friggin' cave, he found a ring that big around. That's wild. And when he told me that, I said, there was no visibility anywhere. Because I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I saw what I saw. And he picked it up. So. That's crazy. Short of, you know, I hear it kind of stood up on my neck. It was kind yeah, of yeah, eerie, yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of divine intervention thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we gave it to the son so that he could have not only closure of his father, but he got his father's wedding ring back. That's, so. that's, it. That, that's kind of like, I know it, it's hard to pinpoint what exactly gets you out of bed in the morning, but I feel like that has to be one of the top, like, like one of the, that's a very powerful feeling, I'm sure. You know, so many years of putting people in bags, and a lot of them shouldn't have been. Um, well, none of them should have been. I mean, were some of them stupid mistakes? Right, sure, right. obviously they're yeah, dead. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the you know the first time that I was called out for a rescue um, was 2006, and it ended up being a fatality. Um, but when I when I'm scootering along in zero visibility, I can barely see the end of my scooter and I'm like bouncing off walls and stuff. And then all of a sudden it's crystal clear. I'm like, I passed him. And I look over to the left because it's supposedly on a jump to the left and I can see this crap billowing out of this tunnel. Like somebody's back there with a broom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember back in 2000 talking to my friend Bill Reniker who had done, got called out for a rescue. And he got in there and he said that, you know, it was zero visibility, but you can see this stuff churning. And he said, I knew that they were alive. And I knew a panic diver was going to kill me. And I turned around and left. I'm like, you knew they were alive and you left? <laughs> He's like, Ed, I'm not dying for anybody. And he said, I went back and got their bodies the next day. And when I got called for that recovery <clears throat> or rescue, I'm going in and it's just churning. And I remember that churning and I'm online and I'm, and I'm making my way yeah, yeah, searching yeah. for this either body or, or victim that I can get out and rescue. And all of a sudden I heard Bill's voice on my shoulder <laughs> and that I'm not dying for anybody. A panic diver is going to kill you. And I thought, I stopped for a second. I'm like, oh shit. Uh, then I thought, what can he do? I'm in a tunnel this tall. We're going to hit head to head, <laughs> worst case scenario. What's he going to do? Rip my mask off? I can't see anyway. I don't need it. And I got a spare one in my pocket. Is he going to rip my regulator out of my mouth? I have a spare one of those too. Is he going to try and get them all? How many hands has this guy got? So I kept going. Yeah. And unfortunately, when I ran into a hand, it wasn't moving and he was deceased. But when I got him out and later on, um, the lieutenant and I were that were doing the uh, incident analysis... Looking at when his computer flatlined, 
that he had stopped moving. And when mine, you know, it's the profile of the cave and then it's flat. I'm at one spot for a while. Right. right. You know, it changes a little bit. Yeah. And then I'm on my way out. I missed him by less than two minutes. Really? And he had taken his tanks off on another dive an hour later after I decompressed and came out for a second, got new tanks. I had to go back in and get his tanks. In that several hours from getting him out, decompressing, getting new tanks and going back in, there was a little bit of visibility. I could see, you know, eight inches, 10 inches. So I started doing the accident analysis on the equipment that was still in there. And his double tanks had over 2000 PSI in them. So he had enough gas to sit at the depth he was at for almost another hour. And I missed him by two minutes. His panic killed him or I'd have got him out. But that's the thing. You just, you just don't know. Sure. Yeah. And, uh, but the first time I did an actual rescue and they got to go home, it was the most incredible feeling I've ever had. Um, in fact, it was the girl got was to, a, got to go home as in they, they lived. She lived. Yeah, yeah. It was a week or two after the incident, uh, the impossible one in yeah, yeah. in the Wasissa River. And I remember the dad in my shop, and he said, "I just want to shake your hand." And he's shaking my hand and he's squeezing my, the life out of my hand. I'm a pretty strong guy. And I'm like, <laughs> holy cow, this guy's going to break my wrist. And he just kept shaking. He would not let go of me. And um, he kept thanking me and thanking me. He said, I can never thank you for what you did, but I, but I want to pay you. And I said, I don't take money for this. I said, I do this as a volunteer. And he said, I could never pay you what it was worth but I want to pay you something. And I said, I, I, I just don't take money for it. Thank you. I said, last week I was shaking the hand of another father and he was thanking me for bringing his son's body home so he could have closure. You get to take yours home today. I said, the best thank you you could give me is to take care of her the rest of her life. And he laughed. So later on, he was an open water diving instructor and so we have, as divers, we have um, a thing called Divers Alert Network. And if you think you have an ailment caused by diving, you call Divers Alert Network. They have emergency response doctors and nurses that will talk you through. You need to go to a chamber. You need to go to this. You need to do that. You need to do this. Well, <clears throat> when he kept asking me and wanted to give me money and I wouldn't take it, he said, can I donate some money to a charity in your name? And I said, there again. I appreciate the offer. I don't want any money. And so apparently he had donated a bunch of money to Dan, um, Divers Alert Network, and in my name and told him a story. And a couple months later, it was coming up, DEMA, our trade show. And the head of Dan called me and he said, are you coming to DEMA? And I said, yeah, always. And he said, I'd like you to be at this dinner as my guest. I said, okay, I'll see if I can make it. And he said, well, I need to know if you're going to make it or not. Well, come to find out that he had given me the first ever Dan Hero Award oh, wow. based on that. But, but yeah, the, the feeling was incredible that, um, you know, I got to send somebody home. Yeah, for, a for change sure. Yeah, of, yeah. You know, to the morgue in a bag. I, that, that is an indescribable feeling. Um, 